this is a Dr. Get presentation, as you know, brought to us by the Advancement Office. And if you don't know our new Vice President of Advancement, it's Ms. Linda Medley. We're very, very, very lucky to have her. And I was asked to introduce our speaker because I've known him for a long time. Before I start, I'd like to tell you that this gentleman is the most ethical person I've ever met in my life, which is a long life. And I don't say that lightly. So I think that what he has to say is something that you can depend on. You know how they say that character is what you do when, not, when everybody's looking at you, or when nobody's looking at you and you know what to do? I think character is when everybody's looking at you and wants you to do something other than what you think is right. And that's what I learned from this man. And you do the right thing. So Lawrence Butterfield is a development director at Commercial Services Group, Inc. in Louisville. Mr. Butterfield has been in the collection business for over 40 years. It means he collects debts. He has presented at over 200 seminars concerning collection matters. He holds an MED from the University of Louisville and has completed postgraduate work at the University of Washington and at Harvard University. Prior to entering the collection business, Mr. Butterfield was a research associate at the American Printing House for the Blind, which is located in Louisville, I believe. He co-authored numerous published research articles as well as building maps for the blind. Mr. Butterfield has served on over 40 boards of trustees in his career, including the Board of Trustees at St. Catherine College. I actually met him when he was the chair of the Board of Trustees at Spalding University. He is the only certified presenter of the American Collectors Association's Educational Foundation's Financial Literacy Program. Ask Dr. Dick. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you my mentor and my friend, Mr. Larry Butterfield. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, nice to be here. Um, first off, I'd like to thank ACA International Educational Foundation. Uh, ACA is a trade group. Uh, and uh, it's their format we'll use, and you can get them online. The same slides you'll see will be um, available uh, when you pull up their website. Once you get the tab, it will say ask, it, it, just type in Ask Octodet, and it will pull it up for you. Um, we're going to talk about uh, two things today, uh, the first being credit cards, and then the second, student loan. Credit is not your right. Credit is a privilege. And it's privilege earned over time. And as you build your credit throughout your life, the better able you're to manage your credit, the more likely you are to be successful in obtaining the best interest rates on loans for either your car or your home or your education. Um, if you don't handle your credit properly, then you face all sorts of difficulties along the way. So we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Credit Card Accountability Act that uh, President Obama um, uh, passed in 2009. So what does that mean? The Credit Card Accountability, uh, Accountability Responsibility and Disclosure Act of 2009. We're going to tell you what it means for you as um, a cardholder. How many here have at least one credit card? Hands up. Okay. Now, did you, when you signed your credit card agreement, did you flip it over and read the fine print? Anybody? One person who happens to be an attorney, all right? So we're going to discuss uh, what uh, the Credit Card Accountability Act of 2009 means. Uh, it was uh, phased in. All phases have now been complete. Um, and the reason it was phased in is it allowed the credit card industry time to uh, generate certain provisions to protect the consumer. Our federal government has reached out um, over the past number of years, especially since Obama's been president, to try to make a level playing field 
for people on all financial institutions. Um, the biggest uh, act passed was Dodd-Frank in 2010, and that was intended to uh, rein in banking institutions, uh, get them away from subprime and derivatives and um, all those uh, uh, financial uh, instruments that nobody could understand without algorithm, et cetera. Um, but it has been somewhat of an invasive law uh, for business, and there's been some reaction to that. So all of the provisions are now in effect, um, and what does that mean for you? Your account changes. The card issuer must provide at least 45 days advance notice to the account holder of any changes, including a change in the interest rate, in regards to their cardholder agreement. Before, you were at their mercy. If they decided they wanted to increase, you just got it. And they were also, further on we'll talk about, they were charging you interest on your interest. So when you get a credit card, people say, oh, I, I just want to pay cash, I don't want to go into debt. But the way for you to build your credit is if you are paying cash, use your credit card, pay it off immediately so you don't pay the interest, you just pay the amount, and your credit score will start climbing as long as you start paying off. The problem is most people in the United States use the credit card to live, and there's always a balance. Let me explain it to you this way. If you went into a store and you saw um, a handbag for $25 and you put it on a credit card instead of paying cash and you didn't pay it, how much is that bag ultimately going to cost you? It's not costing you $25. It's more like probably $35 or $40. It is never the first dollar you put on the pile to purchase something that hurts. It's always the last dollar you put on that pile where you decide, should I buy that purse or not? So if it's $25, would you really pay $40 for it? You may end up doing that if you're putting on your credit card and simply paying the minimum balance. The credit card statements must be sent at least 21 days prior to the due date to give you an opportunity to assemble whatever funds you need as opposed to them sending it two days before and you go, uh, wow, I, I didn't remember that uh, I went to the movies and put the tickets and the popcorn and the Cokes on my credit card and now I'm short and therefore I'm carrying a balance that will have an interest rate applied. And payments received on or before 5 p.m. on the due date are on time. They cannot charge you interest even if you pay at 4.59 the day it's due. And you can pay online and your generation is a lot better and capable of doing that than uh, uh, some of the older uh, holders of cards. The charging of interest, the card uh, issuer cannot raise your interest rates in the first year after an account is open, regardless of what you do. Now, if you're not paying or things like that, generally before the law was in effect, they could jack your interest rates up uh, substantially. And also, your interest rates on all credit cards are negotiable if you read the agreement. But it means you have to do a little due diligence and call the company and say, I'm not interested at 24%. I'm not interested at 18%. I'm not interested at 15.9% and see what they'll do for you. Maybe they'll lower your credit limit, but you can build your credit limit up by maximizing if your credit limit is $500 and if you pay run up charges for 50 and you pay it every month, within a few months, they will be contacting you to ask you if you want to raise your credit limit. You don't have to contact them. 
retroactive increases and in interest rate on existing balances are prohibited unless the minimum payment is not received within 60 days when it's due date. What that means is you have a 60-day grace period of not paying anything. But after the 60 days, they have the ability to raise your interest rates. So be aware of that if you're having uh, some medical problem or some family issue that prevents you from paying, you do have 60 days. But make sure you're either doing something about it or calling the company to find out what's available for you. The rate increases uh, is under a variable interest rate. Again, 24, 18, 15.9, 12. We see all sorts of different interest rates and it depends on who the card issuer is on how they set the rates. The interest rate is under a variable interest rate. It's at the end of a promotional rate. However, the promotional rate needs to be in effect at least six months. So I'm sure you've seen the infomercials out there. Sign up now. Zero interest for, used to be a year. Now you're seeing some of them come out and say, use our card and you get two years free interest. That's their sales technique to get you to use their card because they get paid a percentage from the merchant who uh, uses that particular card. Their billing practices. Card issuers are prohibited from charging a finance charge based on double billing cycle method, interest on interest. That's what that means when they're when you carry a balance forward in his interest, they charge you interest on the interest. Double whammy. They cannot, um, they cannot do that. Card issuers cannot charge a fee on any outstanding credit card balance at the end of the billing cycle if the fee is from interest accrued on the outstanding balance that was fully repaid in the last billing cycle. So, in other words, if your check arrived and their cycle is from the 15th to the 15th and you paid on the 30th, they can't charge you those 15 days that, that it was outstanding. That's, again, they used to be able to do that. Now uh, they can, uh, they're, they're in trouble on the this law. This is that. one of the biggest issues on credit cards. What's my limit? And how do I get the limit? How is it set? And then uh, how do I manage that limit? Requires the card companies to offer consumers the option of having a fixed credit limit that cannot be exceeded. For young people, in many instances, this is a good option because it lets you know that you cannot go over a certain amount because once you meet your threshold and the interest is continuing to accrue, it's a deep hole. It's almost like quickstand to try to crawl out of the, of the problem. So you can request a fixed rate. No over-the-limit fee may be imposed by a credit card issuer if the card exceeds that limit without the express consent of the cardholder. So they cannot just arbitrarily say because you didn't, um, you exceeded your limit, they can't just impose a fee on you um, arbitrarily and just say, well, you exceeded your limit, so we're going to bounce your interest rate up or we're going to charge you uh, a carrying charge for that. And that's, again, no longer uh, allowable under the law. Uh, and a credit card company may only charge a maximum of three over-the-limit fees for the same transaction. So they can only hit you three times. It could be in three consecutive months, but they can't keep doing that until you resolve the issue anymore. It used to be uh, before 2009 when the act was instituted that the credit card companies basically could make the rules and if you had the card, you were required to follow, follow those rules. <coughs> Payment application. When you send your check in, if you don't designate how it is to be applied, if you're paying more, they will simply set it for the next payment amount instead of reducing a, a, a credit limit if you have it. So if you have a balance, you have to say, 
here's $500 more or $100 more and apply it towards my balance. Otherwise, they'll just roll it and the interest is computed in there. And that's, again, no longer allowed by law. Provisions on enhanced disclosures. And I'm sure you see this on your credit card if you have a balance anymore. It used to be that you just got a balance and it's whatever the money was. And it was outstanding and you paid it down. Now, under law, they are required a written minimum payment warning that you see, a minimum amount that you have to pay to be in good standing, must be composed in forming cardholders making only the minimum payment will increase the amount of interest they pay and the time it should take them to repay. Some companies even put a 36 month computation out there for you on your card to tell you this is what you're going to spend if you make the minimum payment and resolve it in 36 months. So you, again, uh, truth in lending, the mortgage companies do this as well. It, they give you the total that you're going to pay, not just the principal balance anymore. Card issuers must inform the cardholder of the number of months rounded to the nearest month it would take to pay the entire amount of their balance if they only made the minimum payment without putting any additional charges on your card. Because if you put more charges on your card, it's going to go up. So that's a nice tool, only if you're not going to add to it. If you're going to add to it, then it gets much more severe, but they are required to do that. Card issues must inform cardholders how much the cardholder will pay in total if the cardholder pays the minimum amount for each month. So they will compute to you again in months, how much you're going to pay that $25 uh, handbag is going to cost you $40. And then you can decide as you compute what you're doing and what your purchases are, is it really worth me having that big screen TV for $2,500 and the actual cost to me at the end is $5,500? Would I spend $5,500 on a big screen? Because I have to have it. Or should I wait until I have a substantial down payment or the money to make that purchase? So you have to always calculate what the end cost is for you. Because as you go through, it's like we'll talk about student loans a little bit. People used to say to me all the time, Larry, it's low interest. My response, you still have to pay it back. Not only the principal, but interest. So it doesn't matter. You have to calculate what your ability to pay is. Um, let's see. Card issuers must inform cardholders how much they would need to pay each month for the 36 months. So that's out there on, on most of the major credit cards. And card issuers must provide a toll-free number with card, which cardholders can call to obtain information regarding the credit counseling and debt management service. Has anybody ever tried to call the 800 number? Who are we speaking to? We're probably speaking to India. Okay. And not to disparage any ethnic group, but the language barrier can be somewhat frustrating as you talk uh, with someone that not only is not in great command of language but doesn't quite understand your plight and, and what you're trying to impart on your, your issue at hand. Uh, it can be very, very frustrating. Do not be afraid to ask for the supervisor. If you cannot understand Ask for the supervisor and get somebody that you can understand, that not only understands, but gets your issue and, and you can resolve it. So it's critical when you're having a problem that you address it. If you take what I call the ostrich approach and put your head in the sand, I can guarantee you one thing is going to happen. It is going to get worse. It's going to cost you more money. 
So reach out when you see something. It may be something on your card that you don't understand. Uh, they have all other issues like identity theft we see all over the place today. Uh, they're starting in this country now to go with uh, chip technology that, uh, that helps prevent some of that. If you've ever gone through that, it is literally a nightmare. So you want to avoid that at all cost. Um, that means protecting your credit, protecting your card, not giving your card out to anybody. Um, there's scammers out there. Once they get your number, um, you know they get a little bit of information, and then they have your entire life. And we're seeing a lot of that uh, fraud coming from Africa uh, these days. Um, it seems to be the hotbed of uh, internet fraud activity uh, comes comes from all over the world, but there's a high prevalence in, in Africa. Uh, now, is there anyone here? under 21? A few people. Okay. Before um, the act went into place, anybody could have a credit card. That meant some seven-year-old kid could pick up the phone and call and get a credit card and then when the bill came due and they called the home and got the parents, um, it was a major problem. So the act um, indicated that card issuers cannot solicit credit cards to anyone under the age of 21. Now that said, they can't provide except if they get a parent, legal guardian, or somebody to co-sign for you. Now, as a young student here, would you co-sign for one of your fellow students? No, absolutely not. No way. Don't do anything like that. Uh, people have enough to deal with on their own credit, which is a privilege, not a right. And for you to build your credit using credit cards, it's an easy way to start establishing yourself and improving your credit score. Uh, you've seen the infomercial on Credit Karma where you can go out and get your credit score. Go ahead and do it. See what it is. And then if you start using a credit card, make sure that you can pay every single month and you'll see your score start building. And I think top score is 830, I believe. Um, and loans are all based on your credit score. It's not where you live, who you know who your father knows, who your uncle is, or whatever, it's based upon your ability to repay. And that's what they look at, your ability to repay. So the quicker you can get that ability rising to your advantage by, you know, even if it's uh, going to Starbucks and putting the coffee on, but make sure at the end of the month that you have enough to pay for that coffee. In other words, don't go every every day and put five dollars or whatever it is on the card and then not have $150 to pay at the end of the month. If you do have $150, then you can go in and you can help establish your credit and you'll see your credit score uh, reach. Okay, interest rates, a card issuer that increases the annual percentage rate applicable to a credit card amount must do so based on factors including the credit risk of the cardholder, market conditions, and other significant factors. What that means is, basically, they can start doing whatever they want. And that's why you have to be diligent to say, oh, I got a new credit card and they've increased my credit rate. I'm going to call them because I can get another credit card for a lesser rate. I'm not going to let that happen. But unless you read the agreement, it's automatically tacked on. Card issue must review every six months accounts for which the annual percentage rate has increased to assess whether such factors have changed, including whether any risk has reduced. Has anybody here ever received a reduction in their credit card rate? Anybody? Only one. It usually never happens, folks. They're not going to call you. You've got to call them. 
And in the event of increase in the annual percentage rate, the card issue must provide in written notice stating the reason for the increase. So they've got to tell you why they're increasing your account. Uh, account. They just can't do it and all of a sudden you look for three months and you see, wow, I've gone from 15.9 to 24 percent and I didn't even know it. They have to put it in writing now and that's federal law. Anybody here receive gift cards? Sure. Okay. Used to be that gift cards expired, you know, nobody knew. What happened to that money? Went into the company's pocket, right. So, it is unlawful for any person to impose a dormancy fee, an activity charge or fee, or service fee with respect to a gift certificate, store card, or general uh, use prepaid card. So, no limits anymore. If you got the card, it's good. It shall be unlawful for any person to sell or issue a gift card, store card, or general use prepaid card that is subject to an expiration date. So if it does have an expiration date on it, it's illegal for you to sell it. And um, there's a lot of illegal activity. Uh, you can buy gift cards at a discount at some place. Uh, don't do it, ladies and gentlemen. That card, that gift card is probably stolen property and somebody's just looking to scam the system. Gift cards must uh, include information on them related to fees, expiration information, and telephone number for assistance so you can call. So if you see anything on the card or you're not familiar with the card or you don't know where you can redeem the card or what the value of the card is, you can always call and get that information now, and that's under federal law. So that basically covers um, credit cards, and it's a... You know, these are basic financial literacy things that uh, you should be aware of. Is it going to happen every day? No. But, folks, when you do get your statement, flip it over, and at least once, look at the fine print. Read it. Try to understand what they're saying. When you see a change, don't be afraid to reach out and complain. But you have to complain with factual information you're able to gain because you have some financial literacy. So be careful with your credit cards. They can get out of hand real quick. And once you get in that hole, it's real difficult to go get out. All right. How many people here have student loans? Okay. All right. You're part of over a trillion, well, it's, it's much bigger than a trillion dollars. Student loan debt is the second largest debt in the United States, only behind mortgage, home mortgages. That includes automobile debt, loans. In default, last year, there was over a trillion dollars in default. In the last quarter, the increase in default was over $35 million in the quarter. <clears throat> that's not issued. That's not loans issued. That's not loans deferred. That's loans in default over a trillion dollars. So it's become an epidemic in the United States, and um, the federal government has tried to um, wade in and do certain things. Um, some of which are uh, to financial institutions that provide training with a hope of a job at the end, but there's never a job. There's only the student debt that remains. Corinthian College was one that was just uh, indicted by the federal government and they paid millions of dollars back to their students because their claims were that they were going to train somebody for a specific job, and at the end of the day, those jobs were not available for their students. And it was unfair for them to make those offers to have people come in and study and put their money down and get no return for it except more debt. Um, today, the uh, Dodd-Frank um, section of Dodd-Frank that deals with 
financial institutions uh, like student loans and collections is called the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, the CFPB. And the CFPB is an extremely invasive uh, organization. It's the only organization in, in the United States, a federal organization, that is not controlled by Congress. It does not have a budget. The budget is obtained by request to the Federal Reserve. So they have an unlimited budget. And they um, initially, one of, one of the things that they were interested in is in um, credit card collection debt. Um, and, and they've made a, a, a big impact there. Um, in addition, uh, their white paper uh, indicates they'll be um, reviewing student loans. As an industry person, when the federal government passed legislation, I would hope that the law would be written fairly promptly. Six years in, we're still waiting for the law to be written, but penalties are accruing. So we have to make our best guess as to what the federal government has in mind for us, which seems somewhat a little bit unfair. It's always when the federal government, in my mind, reacts to uh, people like uh, the collectors, you only hear the sensational stories about the bad people. In my mind, the bad boys are going to be the bad boys regardless of what the rules and regulations are. There are always bad people out there. But 99% of the hardworking men and women that collect every uh, debt every day last year put $43 uh, billion in the United States coffers and impacted every household at the rate of $256 a, a year. So every household in the United States benefited by the work that collection people have done at the rate of $256 positive. Uh, because when somebody doesn't pay, we all pay. The rate goes up. So when somebody doesn't pay or scans the system, the rate is going to go up. You're going to pay more for that goods or services, and uh, unfortunately, everybody else ends up picking up the, the back. So whether you're graduating or just taking a break from college, these tips will help you stay on top of your student loan. That means avoiding fees and extra interest costs and in keeping your payments affordable and protecting that valuable credit rating because that follows you wherever you go anywhere in the world now your credit rating follows you. What type of loan do you have? Is it a federal loan? Is it a bank loan? Is it from the institution? Is it a Perkins? Is it a Stafford? What is it? Well, the only way to find out what it is, is read the document. Make sure you understand what the document is. So keep track of the lender, the balance, and repayment status for each of your student loans. The details determine your options for loan repayment and forgiveness. You can start by asking your lender, and if that doesn't work, you can visit the web. Again, the, these slides are all available on the uh, ACA Educational International Foundation, ACA International Educational Foundation website, and just type in "Ask Dr. Depp." Once you uh, log in, you'll find what your total balances are. You'll uh, find the repayment status of your federal loans, and if if some of your loans are not listed, they are probably private uh, because that will only give you the federal. And for those, uh, for those non-federal, you find out the paperwork that you sign, contact your school, and if you can't locate your records. The major thing here is to make sure you keep your records in order. Get a file, whatever, because if you just throw it in with your regular stuff, it just walks. And then you're scrambling around, you're wondering, what is it? You don't have the documentation. How are you going to make an assessment on what's reasonable for you to do and how do you attack the problem? It's much easier if you have the original document. Unfortunately, sometimes the schools may not have 
what you need. It may have been misplaced, whatever. So it's, it's critical that you have that document that you sign. So make sure you uh, have a special place wherever you put it. Make sure you keep track of what you sign. And then read it before you sign it. Make sure you understand. And if there's anything that you don't understand, make sure you get that answered before you sign on the dotted line. Because once you sign, under the law, ignorance is not an excuse. If you get up there and say, I, I didn't know what I was doing, sorry, you're liable. So it's important to know your loans. This is important if you have a problem. What's your grace period? How long do I have before I have to start paying? Or how long can I withhold? Different loans have different grace periods. How long can you wait after leaving school before you have to make your first payment? Okay, if you're on federal Perkins loans, a great grace period is nine months. So you haven't got nine months. Now, if you can start early, good for you. Start whittling that down because it will help you in the long run. For Stafford and most other um, federal loans, six months. And then the grace period for private student loans vary. So again, consult your paperwork or call the school. So know what your grace period is so you know if you have a problem. If, if something just happens in your life that you're not able to pay, you do have a grace period and you, you're able to understand what that is. Pick the right repayment option for yourself. Okay. Do you pay X dollars a month? Do you pay out of your paycheck, direct deposit? How are you going to handle this? When your federal loans come due, you, you know, your loan payment automatically based on a standard 10-year repayment plan. So they give you 10 years to repay. If you graduate when you're 24, that means for the next 10 years of your life until you're 34, you're going to be repaying that loan every single month, 120 payments, religiously. Okay. That's a big chunk of your young adult life to repay these loans. That's why this is so serious. If the standard repayment is going to be hard for you to cover, there are other options that can help you manage your debt, including alternative payment plans and deferments. But guess what happens if you choose the options? It's not 10 years anymore. It could be 15 years or 20 years. If it's 20 years, that's older than some people that are sitting in the seats here. Your entire life so far, you'll have to double it and continue to repay. That's why it's so important to know what loan you have, know what the options are, and get that thing repaid as quickly as you possibly can. <clears throat> Extending your payment period beyond 10 years can lower your monthly payments, but you'll end up paying more, often a lot more and interest over the life alone. The most important new option is the income-based <coughs> repayment program. Okay, recently um, the federal government has come out with a new income-based uh, program where you report in, a lot of this is online that you can do, and you just plug in what your, interest, uh, what your uh, current uh, situation is and it, it will give you what your options are. So that's important to, for everybody to know because you may think, okay, I got out and I got a teaching position and I'm making $40,000 a year and then two years later there's a cutback at the school and my art teaching job is no longer there and now I'm flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. Well your income has changed. And you need to report that 
and there are programs there at the federal government. Again, it's going to cost you, but they are available for you. If you can cap your monthly payments at a reasonable percentage of income and forgive any debt, after 25 years of repayment. <clears throat> Many of these programs, if you miss one payment, the 25 years starts over. Okay? So you got to know what you're asking for, and this is why it's so critical. Uh, I talked to a gentleman <clears throat> recently who was nine years into a 10-year payment program, and he needed a new car, he thought, and it cost him another 10 years. Uh, again, it was lower amount. But again, 10 years of your life is a big segment of your life to repay. That's 120 consecutive months. So be careful. Um, forgiveness may be available after 10 years of repayment to borrowers in the public and nonprofit sectors. Okay, basically there are some forgiveness programs out there now that if you are in them, they'll forgive the debt. One of them is, we'll see later, is nursing. So check where, you, where, where you're gonna go, see if it may be a rural area or a particular area where the federal government will uh, recognize the importance of your position, whether it be a teacher or nurse or you join the Peace Corps or some of those organizations, you may be able to get a forgiveness <clears throat> of your entire debt depending upon length of service or whatever, and it's a contract you sign with the federal government. And this, this only covers uh, federal loans. Okay, Stay in touch with your lender. It's like everything else. If you're having a problem, if you put your head in the sand, what did I tell you? One thing is going to happen, it's going to get worse for you. You're going to pay more, it's going to be more expensive for you. So again, it's not embarrassing, this is simply a financial issue that you you have to address. People tell me all the time, how do you do your job? You call people for money all the time. Doesn't it bother you? I don't owe the money. It's not my it's not my issue. I am a solution. So it doesn't bother me because I don't owe the money. It's not a worry to me. So make sure that you stay in touch. When you move, address, phone number, any contact information, email, whatever you have, Facebook, whatever it is, uh, make sure that they, they have those contact information. Uh, if you're getting unwanted calls from your lender or a collection agency, don't stick your head in the sand. Talk to them about the issues. Lenders are supposed to work with borrowers to resolve uh, problems, ignoring bills or serious problems can lead to default. Again, if you don't talk to me, the next venue is court. So would you rather talk to me and stay out of court because then your credit score goes down further if you have any legal issues? Because right now, if you're talking to me, I may tell you we're a credit reporting agency, but we have not reported this yet. So if you deal with it now, it simply goes away as a paid debt over time. But if you ignore or hang up the phone or do something egregious to me, the next step, you're going to get sued in all likelihood. Okay? You don't want to go there. You simply don't want to go there. And people in my industry want you to pay. We earn money when you pay us. We, learn, we earn more money when you pay us as opposed to pay the attorney that we employ because we have to then give the attorney some of the money. So realize that when you get that call, don't be embarrassed, don't be frustrated. Simply methodically answer the questions that are posed to you to the best of your ability and try to knock something out. Again, we've talked about those options, whether it's deferment or forbearance, but 
you know, interest continues to accrue. Um, first, see if you, you could have an income based repayment. Again, in some of these positions, it could be zero. They could forgive your entire debt. You know, they, if you join the Peace Corps or Marisurve or, or some of these other programs or in, in some uh, doctors or whatever, if you go to underserved areas where they need somebody in a rural area or something like that. But these programs are available and you can find them on the federal government's website. So it behooves you to go out and, and do the research. Figure out is there something that they can help me with. I feel like your parent. <laughs> Stay out of trouble. Now, you probably heard that from the time uh, you could understand language. Or, you know, or when you're a little kid and your parents said something, not me. Well, it's your finances and it is you. And the quicker you address it, the more forthcoming you are, uh, and the better equipped you are to make a deal or uh, find a solution, the easier it's going to be in the long run. It's going to hurt now. But what frustrates me is when I'm talking to a college graduate, because I collect student loans as well, and I call at 10 o'clock and they pick up the phone and they say, well, I can't find a job in, in, in my field. Well, I travel around Louisville and I see help wanted signs all over the place. It may be handing out dry cleaning, it could be at a burger place or whatever, but you can either sit and do nothing or start facing the responsibility that I'm now an adult, I need to face my obligations and if I can earn something and repay, I need to start doing that now as opposed to just sitting there um, and not doing anything. So it's very frustrating to me when I hear that. Uh, it's just my, one of my personal biases. I grew up on a farm and from the time you could walk, you were working. You know, uh, the animals didn't, didn't care how old you were. You know, they just wanted to be fed and, and whatever. So again, stay out of trouble. And if you can't, make sure you reach out and be forthcoming and honest with the people you're talking with because they're there to help you. Lower your principal amount if you can. Again, you have to specify when you're paying more, put this on the principal. Otherwise, they'll roll it over and part of it will be accrued in the next interest payment you make. So make sure you specify that you're reducing the principal amount when you send that payment. So every time you can kick in another $25 or $50 or 100 bucks or whatever it is, it's going to help you in the long run because it, it computes that interest on a lower amount. So you're reducing your payment. Even if it's $500 and you can make it now, if you can pay $550 and put $50 on, then your interest rate will go down. So that's why that's critical. Next. Again, basic math. If you got three loans, and one's at 24% and one's at 18 and one's at 12. Who do we pay first? The 24. We keep the other current, but we're putting all the money towards the 24%. So pretty, pretty standard. Do you consolidate or not? Again, if you're uh, a flipper on the TV like I am and see these infomercials, you know, we can solve your problems for you. Just give us a call and we'll take care of everything and we'll stop everything. Wrong. A lot of times, some of these institutions are scams. Um, it's very important for you to, if you're going to consolidate, that you do so through an organization that you know that you can trust. Not to say that Everybody on the infomercials is not on the up and up, but a lot of them out there, um, you know, tell you wonderful things or like they can get rid of your debt and they can solve all the problems. The only way to solve it, if you borrow the money, is to repay it in some fashion. 
Now, somebody may take less, but you're still going to have to repay it. You're not going to, unless circumstances come up, have it forgiven totally. And go ahead. Again, Ask the Doctor Dad is a resource provided by ACA International Education, International Educational Foundation, and the Credit Card Accountability Responsibility and Disclosure Act is uh, on that uh, slide there. And does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Well, I've been paying on my school loan. Uh, about 25 years. Yes, sir. And should I, and I still get the, uh, I guess I should notify them I've been paying 25 years, because it's been about 25 years, maybe over 25 years I've been paying. Uh, I'm still paying, uh, by the way, I just want everyone to know, I, I've been paying my, my debt off, I'm 60, and I'm still paying my debt off. You know, so, well, uh, Yes, I would suggest you contact them. Now, the largest segment of the population with defaulted student loans. Anybody have a guess of what the age range would be? <coughs> How about senior citizens? Senior citizens are the fastest growing population of defaulted student loans in the country. Senior citizens who have already many retired because they let life get in the way, they had families, children, whatever, they paid a little bit, like the story I told you, the guy paid nine years on a 10 year repayment and then he had to have a car, a brand new one. Well, he made a choice and it cost him 10 more years. So I would suggest to you to reach out to whoever is carrying that, whether it's federal, uh, if it's federal, mm -hmm. you might be able to get some relief. If it's um, through the institution, sorry, they're going to want their money. Uh, that's just the way it is. But here's a prime example. 60 years old, for many of you that's 40 years. Double your lifespan so far, and he's still paying. Anybody else? Why don't you tell them about some of the things you can do, for example, if you work with, if it collection agent calls, I know you've told me you've been able to arrange interest-free credit cards. Right, so that somebody right, right. Somebody owes uh, uh, $1,000, okay? They say they don't have any money and they could pay $100 a month, okay? So I want them to pay the 1000 now and I can help them establish credit. So there's three or four uh, credit card companies out there today that have zero rate interest for a year or more. Okay, so for $1,000, that's about 85 bucks a month, okay? So we tell them, sign up for the credit card, automatic $1,000 limit, and then they pay the credit, they, 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 when they get the, the, they max out the card, send us the $1,000, so we're paid, we show it as paid on their credit, and then they start building with the credit card company every month the $85 payment. So not only have they taken a negative, they've gotten two positives out of it. They've resolved this debt and they've built their credit in building their credit score. That's why I would suggest that when somebody calls, instead of reacting of, oh my dear, uh, they're knocking, the wolves are knocking on the door or whatever, that you reach out to people because we have solutions. Um, it's the type of thing that, um, I, I talked to somebody recently that works at UPS, a, a girl, and uh, she owed about 2,500 bucks. Well, uh, she told me she could work 10 hours overtime a week and earn um, $18.11 an hour overtime. Okay, so that's $180 a month minus whatever the taxes were, so she could pay $150 a week extra. So she could make a little bit on her regular and then from getting working harder, 
another 10 hours on the weekend, she could get the $150 to me. So then the $150 became $300, and she was able to resolve the debt in about uh, eight, eight months, as opposed to I can only pay $150, which to me would be unacceptable because when an institution provides me with an amount of money, they're saying to us, get us payment in full now. This is two, three years old. And if we go ahead and say, oh yes, it's, it's, it's pay us $50 a month, we're good. We're doing a disservice to our client, to the institutions that we represent, because they have, they, they can't go to the, to the, to the utility and say, uh, Jeannie Smith is a, a good student, but she can only pay $50 a month, so uh, can you keep our lights on and we'll make you a part payment? Your lights are off. So it's, it's critical, or, or they look at the school and say, well, the school has a lot of money, it's a big institution. School's like anything else, they have to pay their bills. So, you know, it, and again, it's a domino effect, and when, when somebody doesn't pay, then we all pay more because tuition has to go up to cover the expense that, that we have when somebody doesn't pay. So it's critical to talk with people to try to work things out. Um, we don't necessarily perhaps roll over on the first offer. People, uh, to me, part of my routine is parents, grandparents, today, r right now, one of the things that always is included is IRS return. How much? When? So these are, are things that we look at from a financial basis, not based upon we're trying to intimidate you or beat you up or uh, do something to you psychologically, whatever, pressure. What we try to do is understand your financial situation and then make the best deal for our client to get them paid as rapidly as possible. So that's, uh, that's how we address those issues. But thanks for asking. That's a good question. Anybody, any else? Anything else? Yes? If we do not have a credit card, would you suggest this building credit now? Yes. I would suggest that only in the scenario that you pay that every month religiously. But yeah, uh, the quicker you can get a credit card and start establishing credit for yourself, because when you do go out, if you open it up, I need an apartment. How am I going to get an apartment when they ask me for credit references? Oops, I don't have any, okay? When you go to apply for a loan for a car, who, who's your credit reference? That means somebody's gonna have to co-sign for you, usually your parents or relatives or somebody like that. So yeah, the quicker you can establish, I, I know of um, several six and seven year olds that have credit cards and their financial literacy is starting then and building. So by the time they get to college, they'll be much better uh, equipped to handle their issues. Because, you know, it comes up. What, what happens if you, 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 know, you need that book and you don't have enough in your checking account? Well, you can put it on the credit card. You can get that book and it's 30 days later before you pay. It could be 35 days or something, but you know, usually 30 day cycle. So it gives you a buffer. Does anybody know when credit cards first appeared in the United States? 1955. Not that long ago. Before that, it was cash and carry. So in 1955, MasterCard started. So you know, it's, uh, it's a relatively new industry. And, you know, the, the bottom line on the industry now is there's a, a, a new industry called debt buying, okay? And it was created a lot to do with credit cards. When the Federal Reserve, when the FDIC said to the banks that your non-performing credit card debt after 90 days are going to count on your discount rate on the money you get from the Fed, they said, how do we move them off the books? They move them off the books by selling them to make these big companies that buy the entire 
country of Bank of America. So every credit card debt that's 90 days old, uh, Midland Financial would buy it and then distribute it to companies like myself or attorneys all over the country at one time, maybe 700 firms, and they would collect that credit card debt. But they would pay pennies on the dollar for that, but it would behoove the bank to move it off the balance sheet because the discount rate when they're borrowing millions of dollars from the feds, a quarter of a point or an eighth of a point on your interest rate really means significant dollars. So as, as the economy has grown uh, more sophisticated, so have the vehicles that are available for people to, you know, work through that system. And, and federal government has tried very hard to uh, protect the consumer. Uh, some very good ways, some, in my opinion, questionable ways. So, anybody have anything else? I think we're about well, at the end of our... One more. Sorry. I have a quick question. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, my advisor was telling us the other day about starting to get to earn credit. I've never had a credit card, I have no loans, nothing. And um, she said that her husband, when he was in college, his parents didn't want to give him a credit card. So they got him like a store card at Walmart right. and like that he would get his groceries because you're doing that sure. anyways and sure. they would just pay it off every month. Correct. And that's a way to build. Absolutely. I think that's safe. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You okay. know, uh, it, it used to be years ago that every little place had their own private mm -hmm. credit card. Uh, okay. And then it became a little bit too expensive uh, for them to operate with all the technology that's uh, has to be in place to do that, but uh, some of the bigger ones like Walmart, they do, and that's an absolutely fabulous way to start. So it could be in credit. my name, but Correct. the parents make, could make payments on it. That would be their way of giving you money to buy groceries. Anybody that will tell you, it doesn't matter who pays. Pay. Okay? okay, it doesn't matter who pays. Anybody right. can pay. Uh, it's like under federal law, if I call. Uh, a, a student loan and their parents call. I have to tell them under federal law I cannot speak with them, I cannot divulge anything about the issue. The only thing I can do is I can take a check by phone or credit card. <laughs> that's the only thing I can do and I, you know, that's it. And people become very, very frustrated with us, angry with us because, you know, we decline to speak, but that's federal law. And I can be placed, I can be put out of suit and put out of business for violation of statute if I, if I do that. So it's your credit. That's what I remember when I said that in, in, in the uh, initial part. It, it's your ability and it travels with you for the rest of your life. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.